I've been growing in this raised bed garden for five seasons, and I'm gonna tell you how we made it, what I love about it, and what I would change. Let's go. Hey everyone, I'm Erin, the Amici Gardener, and I wanna to talk to you today about my vegetable garden. Now, we built this raised bed vegetable garden in 2018, uh, before I was on YouTube, so there isn't really any video of this, but I wanted to talk to you about it because it is one of my very favorite parts of the entire garden. And this was my dream garden. I planned this and waited to be able to make this garden for many years. So before I had the vegetable garden that I had now, I had a different kind of vegetable garden. And this garden was something we built. And this is exact an exact replica of something we saw when we were in New Zealand. It was at a vineyard and they grew a ton of vegetables in this. They actually had theirs uh, caged around the side and the top to protect from birds. I had mine caged around the side to protect from deer. And the only thing I would have changed about that bed was that I would have enclosed the back of it to get more growing space so that it would have been U-shaped rather than just two skinny beds down the side. And also I should have put some uh, reinforcement in those long skinny beds because it wasn't too long before those really started bowing badly and that's really the issue with long skinny beds is that they bow quickly so that was my first vegetable garden and I loved it and it was perfect in so many ways except for that we just ran out of room so I kept adding more raised beds outside of the fence to grow things that didn't need to be fenced and eventually it was just kind of a mishmash over there and so it was really exciting when we figured out that we could finally just go for it and build this raised bed garden. Now there are some parts of this garden that I absolutely love and there are definitely things that I wish I would have done differently and I'm going to share that all with you now. So I had a couple of requirements when I was building this raised bed garden. First of all there was really only one spot on the property it could go that was sunny enough. And I'll tell you, we're even stretching it with the sun because there are a lot of big trees to the south and to the west. Um, but there was really only one flat area where a garden of this size could go. It was important to me, because I learned my lesson with the first garden, to make this the right size from the get-go, to make this as much space as we would ever want for growing vegetables or whatever else we wanted to grow in there, um, because there is no place else to add on. So it was really crucial to me to just make this right from the get-go. I also knew I wanted to do tall raised beds having gardened in tall raised beds, I don't wanna do anything else. It is so nice not to have to bend over. And I am a huge proponent of raised beds in general. They are an additional cost, but if you can afford it, it is 100% worth it to go with raised beds. I also knew that we would have to fence this area um, because we have a lot of deer. So obviously a fence was gonna be crucial to this and aesthetics were equally as important as function to me. I really wanted a very well-organized symmetrical design, which is not where I usually go with design, but for this area, I wanted it to be very neat and very symmetrical. So the garden area is about 40 feet wide by 50 feet long. I have eight four by eight raised beds in there and four two and a half by five foot raised beds. And I wanted to leave that center area open for something. When I was designing it, I didn't know what would go there. I was thinking maybe like a little cafe set, a little table and chairs. Um, what eventually ended up going there, and I still love having there, is my stock tank pond water feature there. So spacing was a big concern and I spent a lot of time on that. There are three and a half foot wide paths uh, that bisect the whole garden. So the main walkways are three and a half feet wide. And then between the beds, it's only two feet and the same goes for behind the beds to the skinny in-ground beds that I have on the outside of the garden. And then of course I have gates on the front and the back. The front gate is decorative, the back gate is not, but I wanted that back gate because the compost bins are right out the back door. So I wanted to make sure to have super easy access to the compost bins. And I will tell you that part couldn't be better. That was a really good plan. And then of course we needed a fence. And so we have a six foot fence on there. It's plenty for the deer. We've never had any problem. Um, deer can jump higher than that, but they rarely jump into things where there's other things around. If that were open space, 
like a really tasty deer treat in the middle, um, then yes, deer might jump over it, but they would never do that because there's no clear landing area for them. I also think our deer are too lazy to bother. To the east of that bed is our septic mound. And you know, you're really not supposed to be like building too close to your septic mound. And I actually had to call some people and talk to our septic people to make sure like, is it safe to put a vegetable garden like close to the septic mound? And they said, we were fine. It's not like on the septic mound. Um, and the septic mound, which they test every couple of years is functioning fine. So there was no reason to think that. Plus most of everything we grow in there uh, goes in a raised bed with 21 inches of soil in it. So probably not an issue. So the first thing we did, we hired this landscaping company. They level the entire thing. So now we've got, you know, just a flat, muddy surface, basically. So after we had everything graded, we had a nice flat level surface. We used string to put lines everywhere to make sure that everything was gonna be perfectly symmetrical. And once we figured that out, then we spray painted the beds onto the ground. So the beds themselves are six courses of four by four dimensional lumber. Now I chose that method because I was petrified of that bowing happening, happening again, like it happened in our first garden. I hated the look, it was just messy, and I didn't wanna have to worry about putting some kind of tie rod between those sides to keep something from bowing. So that's why we went with the four by four. We use two types of wood for this. We use cedar for the bottom course and untreated pine for the top course. Now, I don't know if that cedar is gonna last longer. To be honest, when we pulled apart the first raised bed, uh, we had used cedar posts to build that. And those cedar posts were just as rotted as any of the pine. So cedar is not the same as it used to be. Old growth cedar is a completely different animal. And I honestly don't know if it's that much better than regular pine. But we did treat that cedar with an internal wood stabilizer. So those entire posts, I coated that on that bottom because I knew that would have ground to ground contact. The first course was put in and everything was done with a butt joint. So um, we would nail the butt joint in from the ends. Now this was where we had our little snafu because we bought four by eight lumber thinking all we would have to do is cut the boards in half so we would have four feet for the ends and eight feet for the length. But we failed to do the math and realize that there was gonna be that overlap for the butt joint, which added on an additional three and a half inches, which of course, because I designed everything to be so tight, there was no room for just enlarging these beds. So if you are building raised beds and it's important to know exactly the right size, take note what the outside dimension is gonna be, not the inside dimension. So we went about building all of the raised beds, which was far more time consuming than it should have been because of course we had to cut every single board. We had to cut three and a half inches off the end of every single board. It was way more cuts than we had ever planned. So we spent like the good part, the better part of an entire day just cutting all the boards, which was not in the plan. So we built these beds to not move. So the very first course, um, we drove those into the ground probably seven inches or so with, I would say probably six per bed um, or more um, with like a tie rod kind of thing, sort of a um, rebar type thing. So, so that first course was anchored really, really strongly into the ground. So that was not gonna shift. So as we added courses, each course was driven into the course below it with a very long spiky nail. We probably used eight of those per course. It was certainly overkill, I'm sure, but we figured as long as we're doing this, let's do it right. So we just continued to add courses on there. So ultimately, like I said, we did six courses. That's 21 inches tall. And then when we were finished, I used that internal wood stabilizer and used the in, coated the entire inside of the bed in that. And then I used a, a natural organic stain for the outside of that bed. And I'll put links to both of those products uh, below for you. So far, I've been very happy with them, but I don't know how well that internal wood stabilizer is working because I can't see. So we'll find out when these beds, like when things start disintegrating, we'll find out how long that lasted. Now, when it came time to fill the raised beds, I did not use the hookah culture method, which is where you put anything organic, branches and logs and 
leaves and whatever will break down in the bottom of a tall raised bed and then top off the rest with soil. Um, that is a very effective way to fill up a bed, by the way, and it is what I used in the first raised bed garden that we did. My one complaint with that method is that because that organic material breaks down and compacts with the weight of the soil that you put on top of it very quickly, you end up with raised beds that are perpetually sinking. And so the first year, you have to go back and put in a lot of soil to top those raised beds off. And my personal thing is that I like raised beds to be filled to about an inch from the top. I don't know why that is, but I'm super picky about that. Personally, it's my own little hang up. So that's why I didn't use hygge culture. And I thought this was sort of a in for a penny, in for a pound situation by the time we had done all this. So we filled those beds from top to bottom with the same thing. Now we could have put a lower grade of soil in the bottom probably, Again, at this point, it didn't really matter, and it seemed like the easy way, easiest way out of this was to just fill the whole thing up with whatever we needed. Now, really crucial thing here, I am very glad that at this point we did not have the fence in yet because we were able to use a, you know, somebody's machine with a bucket on the front to put the, use the bucket to get the soil in there. If we had had the fence up, we obviously wouldn't have been able to do that. Now what I used in there was a bulk raised bed mix that I bought from a local place. And I forget the exact content of it, but it was all sorts of things. It was compost and topsoil. Um, there was sand in it, there was manure in it, there was worm castings, there was rock dust. It was really nice, light, beautiful, expensive soil. And it was wonderful. By the way, of course I have to top that up basically every year, but fortunately I'm able to usually just top it up with my homemade compost. Lately I've been using the compost blend from Organics Mechanics to top up my vegetable gardens every year, and that's been working really well for me. So once the beds were built, then we had to deal with the base. And here is where our biggest mistake came. So my whole plan was to have gravel between all of the beds. Now, I do not like putting landscape cloth underneath gravel. I have dug out too much landscape cloth from underneath gravel before to know how bad that is when it stops working. It works great for a couple of years. And then when it stops working, it's just it's so bad. And the biggest issue with it is that invariably soil gets in there, right? Soil comes out of beds or, um, or just material just breaks down and you end up with organic matter mixed into your gravel, which seeds then fall into and then sprout. And the problem is, is that if you have landscape fabric, those plants put roots through the landscape fabric. So you can't pull the plants out because they're going through the landscape fabric. And if you start pulling too much, the landscape fabric comes up it's not something I wanted to deal with and I sort of swore that off. So all of my gravel paths and anything gravel on this property does not have landscape fabric underneath it. The method that I use is to buy a, a compactable base of some kind. So in this case, it was limestone screenings and I think that's because that's very cheap near us. And so we did about four inches of base underneath that compacted and then another about two inches of three quarter uh, inch chip gravel on top or decorative stone, whatever they call it, on top of that. Here's the problem though. We had built the raised beds. So we wanted those beds to be 21 inches tall, but if you take the level ground and now you add on six inches between the gravel chip, the stone chips, and the compacted base, well suddenly your 21 inch beds are not 21 inches anymore. And also you don't really want to put all that around the wood you just had there, right? So that was our big mistake. We did things in the wrong order. And so what we ended up having to do was we had to, we tried to dig it out by ourselves. We tried to dig out all of that material between the beds. And that was a special kind of hell in part because this is now, you know, at least a month has passed. This pro this was a very long building process for us because we did a lot of it ourselves when we could find time. And by this point, the ground, which was there was a good amount of clay in it over there because the soil had been disturbed when the mound was put in eons ago. Um, so what happened was it was clay and you couldn't get it out. And we had been walking all, it had been 
pounded down when they leveled it, and then we had been walking on it. So it was impossible. So we ended up hiring that landscaper to come out and dig those beds out. So once that was all dug out and they removed it, they took the soil with them because it had to go somewhere. Then we laid down that base, compacted, we rented a plate compactor, compacted all that base, brought in the gravel, spread it out, all of that was fine. So if I were doing this project again, the way I would have done this was have them level out that area and remove a little bit of soil to give us you know, a few inches down from grade to work with. Then I would have brought in the, um, the base material and I would have put it everywhere and compacted it anywhere where the raised beds weren't going to be. And then I would have brought in gravel and spread the gravel evenly over the whole thing. So there probably would have been several inches of gravel underneath those raised beds, but I don't worry about that gravel under those raised beds with just plain soil underneath it. I didn't want that compacted base under there. Now the garden has two skinny in-ground beds. This is where I grow my espalier pear and espalier apple on the east and west sides of the garden. Um, and those I used metal edging to just create a straight edge to hold the gravel in. And then we just planted, we did a small amount of mending of the native earth, but basically it's just planted in native earth there. And then along the back, same thing with the metal edging. So that whole process took the whole summer. So I grew in those raised beds that first summer. Um, what we did for a temporary deer fence was I put tall bamboo stakes in the ground and then I used nylon string and put three rows of it starting at about a foot and a half off the ground and going up to maybe four or five feet and a deer no deer went in there so if you need a temporary and very ugly deer fence that will work at least for a time so we did eventually get a fence company to come and build a fence which didn't happen i think until like november or december of that year of that year. So I grew in those raised beds for a whole year before we had a fence there. And the fence was far more expensive than I thought it would be. I have never priced a fence before and ended up making up a large amount of our budget. Probably, I don't exactly recall, but I would say the fence was equal to equal or more than as much money as we had spent on that up to that point. One of the things I treated myself to was a custom gate. Unfortunately, um, we have a friend who's um, a fabulous woodworker and he made me that. He also made our kitchen cabinets. But so I drew it out for him um, and he designed it. And I went and did that because I kind of figured I was only probably gonna have one opportunity to have a garden gate in my life. And I just wanted it to be something really special. And then we added the little um, pergola. Is it a pergola or an arbor? Whatever it is over the top. I actually have a blog post about that. In fact, I have blog posts about everything I've talked to you about from back then when it was really fresh in my mind. So I will also put links to all that. So if you are looking for more specifics on the building process or anything else, you can look there. So four years later, I can tell you that by and large, I am extremely happy with how this garden turned out and it works very well for me. Um, I am very happy that I put that two foot spacing between the beds. Um, that was a little out there and it's not been an issue at all. I have never had to get a wheelbarrow between the beds. I just come in from the ends if I need to get a wheelbarrow in there. It works perfectly. The spacing feels really good when you're in the garden. It feels, everything feels right. You never feel like you're being swallowed by anything. It just feels good. But there are some things I would change if I were to do this again, and not just from the construction point of view in those things that I've already addressed. So the main thing that I would change if I were doing this again is that I would hearken back to that first raised bed garden we have and I would make the outside in-ground beds that we have, I would make those into raised beds. Now I probably wouldn't raise them up the full 21 inches, but I would make a short raised bed in part because it would look so much neater. It's kind of messy along those edges. I also feel like we would have much better soil in there because I deal with a lot of, there's a lot of drainage situations over there because I've got really sandy soil on one side. I've got kind of weird clay mixed with sand on the other side. Um, so it's not really the best for growing and I like to make use of that space as best I can. 
And then what I would do if I had had those short raised beds is I would have built the fence into them. So the fence post could have been in the raised beds and the fence could have just extended up, which also would have solved a little bit of a problem that I occasionally have, which is rabbits getting in. So the fencing that we used is two by four inch squares, which is plenty big for a baby rabbit to get through. Uh, so we have had that happen on a case, or maybe even a bigger rabbit, I don't know. But we've had that happen on occasion. So I wouldn't have to worry about that because I have to go around now and I have to, you know, make sure that the fence is all blocked at the bottom. So if I had to add those raised beds there and then we just extended the fence up from there, that would be a very good, I think it would also be a very attractive look. We would have had to, you know, really think about how to support very long skinny raised beds. We absolutely would have had to build in a lot of structural reinforcement. And of course, at the time, the idea of buying all that extra lumber on a project that was already kind of a financial stretch was not at all appealing. But you know, all things, if I could have, if I could do it over, I'd probably find the money to build raised beds in those places. The other thing that I would do, and frankly, I still could do this, but it would have been nicer if I had thought of this at the time, was I think I would add some cold frames in the ground, cold or in the, you know, low in the ground cold frames. If you've ever seen like Monty Don's cold frames that he has along his shed with the big windows that kind of pull up, I would have put those along the outside of the fence on the south end of the garden um, because I think I would get a lot of use from cold frames. And I think that would have been looked much nicer if that were built in before the fence was there. Of course, I could still add that and I very much that might still happen. It's where I have the boxwoods planted right now. I would just move those boxwoods and I would put cold frames there. But it would have looked much nicer if the fence would have come out of those because then the whole thing would have been integrated. There are a few things that I love that I've already touched on. I love the height of the beds. That is absolutely the perfect height of beds for me and I feel like I can garden for a long time in those beds. Like, you know, the less I wanna bend over, the better it is to work in those beds. I'm also really happy with the large space that I left in the middle. I love that stock tank pond that's in there. And even if I don't love that forever, I still think a cute little cafe set would be really nice there. Or maybe a giant pot with, uh, you know, some great, great bunch of flowers coming out of it, whatever. But I like having kind of a focal point in the middle of the garden. I also really like the two different sizes of beds. I use those two and a half by five foot beds, primarily for growing cut flowers. And it just adds, it's kind of a nice little spot to just add more color. Not that you can't put flowers anywhere you want in your garden, but I sort of like that kind of focus in the middle. And of course, I absolutely adore my gate. I still love that gate. I love everything about it. I find it very charming and um, I'm very happy with that. You know, I had told you that when we created this design, one of the things I really wanted was to have a garden that met our needs, that we would be able to, for many years, be happy with the gardening space that we had. And I feel like we pretty much hit that nail on the head. I mean, I could fill up garden beds for days. I could just keep I would just keep filling garden beds. But in terms of producing what we need out of a garden, um, it pretty much hits the nail on the head. I mean, the two of us have plenty of, plenty of great vegetables. I also have plenty of things to share. I'm able, I have enough room to experiment and spend some time growing kind of oddball plants that I don't really know if we're even gonna like or even gonna work, but there's room for that to, sp to spare a little bit of room to try out some different things. And that I love quite a bit. Okay, so that's my raised bed garden. I love the thing. I love it. It is productive and beautiful. And most nights after work in summer, I come home from work, I grab a glass of wine and I walk out there and I just putter around and it's pure bliss for me. Absolutely love it. I hope you have a garden space that you love equally as well. Um, but if you're creating one, hopefully this was a little bit helpful. And again, don't forget lots of links available from this, from the blog and everything else. So do check the links in the description below for more information if you need any of that. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.